So I, 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 as Emily said, I'm a professor at University of California, Santa Cruz, uh, but I wear lots of hats in this life, and, and one of them is that I am a National Geographic emerging explorer. I'm not quite sure what I'm emerging from, but so be it, that's what it's called. Uh, in any sense, uh, a few years ago in that capacity, we were out in the field and decided to put together a really short overview, video overview, that was actually later used for a program called the World Science Festival, which is held in New York City uh, every spring. And the program that I was involved in was called Cool Jobs, and my role here, the job of this video, was to, uh, to prove that my job was in fact very cool. It was in fact a competition between me and someone else, and that person shot onto the stage with a robot jetpack, and then actually managed to raise himself in the air several feet, so uh, yeah, I lost. <laughs> But in any sense, this is, this is the video, so, and bear with the sound quality, it's slightly poor. So this is really cool. What we've just found, you can see, is one, two, three, four pieces of mammoth bone here. This is part of a vertebra, so you can see how big this is. And the neat thing about this is that these are the small pieces, which means that the stuff is washed downstream. See, these pieces are actually still frozen in the permafrost. We can't get them out at all, which means they're going to be really well preserved. Just heard that big splash of water back there. That means another hole's broken through. Here comes the water. We better get out of here. <laughs> so the last bit's a little bit silly. But uh, in my defense, that water is really gross. So uh, that is um, in the gold mining district called the Klondike, which is near Dawson City, in Canada's Yukon Territory. And what's going on there is that gold miners collect water in big holding ponds every spring after the snow melts, and then they spray it up against this permafrost, or the frozen dirt that's there. And they wash away the, the layers that are thawed because of being hit by the sun. They stop the warm summer sun, melts the next few centimeters, and they wash that away. And their aim is to get rid of all of that frozen dirt and get to the gold-bearing gravels that are beneath. But in the process, all of this dirt, which is just full of decaying plant matter and animal matter and bones, like those mammoth bones that I was pulling out, that have been there for as long as 700,000 years. So you can imagine that it wouldn't be very nice to all of a sudden be splashed by water full of 700,000-year-old rotting plant matter, right? You want to stay out of that. So I'm actually, uh, I'm a biologist, or a molecular paleontologist, or a molecular biologist, or a geneticist, call it whatever you want, but uh, what is a biologist doing climbing around in the frozen, stinky dirt, collecting frozen bones? My research actually focuses on climate change, and when we hear about climate change today, or we see images of what climate change is causing, often we see things like this, where changes in weather patterns have resulted in massive desiccation in some parts of the world, changes in storm patterns that can be incredibly destructive from flooding as well as drought, and of course, different species that have been pushed to the brink of extinction. And when we read about climate change, often what we see are crazy headlines just telling us that everything is terrible. We're all going to go to hell in a handbasket, pretty much, right? But if you're a biologist, rather than just think about how awful it's going to be, one thing you might want to learn is how will the species and populations, communities and ecosystems that are alive today respond to the climate change that's predicted to happen over the next decades to centuries? If you follow the climate change literature at all, you've probably seen a plot like this one. This is commonly called a hockey stick graph. It looks a bit like a hockey stick on its side, with the long end of the hockey stick and then the, the short end that you use to hit the puck. You know, hockey over here, right? Sticking up on the other side. That line across the middle is the average global temperature in about 1960. And what this is showing is a proxy for average global temperatures over the last thousand years. So you see that 1,000 years ago to something around 100 years ago, the temperatures were about constant, maybe declining just a little bit. And then within the, and then within the last 100 years, the temperature has rocketed up about a degree. Of course, this plot can be extended forward in time, and there are predictions that show that it's continuing to rocket up, skyrocketing pace with massive global warming and lots of catastrophic consequences. 
This, of course, is not the first time in history that the Earth has experienced a pretty massive global warming event. If we extend this plot backward in time, the last 50,000 years is now shown on this plot, through 1,000 years ago, this plot ends over here, where the top one begins, we see that around 20,000 years ago, there began a previous rapid global warming event. In fact, between 20,000 years ago, which was the peak cold part of the last glacial maximum, the last ice age, to around 10,000 years ago, the beginning of the Holocene warm interval that we're in today, the global temperature, average global temperature, increased about eight degrees. And this last period of increase that you see after a slight stabilization there, some work done in the Klondike is beginning to suggest may have happened on the order of several decades to less than a century. So that's about a four-degree increase globally over a very short period of time. So what I do, and people who are interested in studying the same type of thing I am, is we go back in time throughout these last 50,000 years, and possibly even a little bit older than this, and ask how did the species and populations and communities that were alive, that survived through this transition from the peak of the last ice age into the warm interval of today, how did they respond to this period of rapid global warming? The goal of this research is to try to figure out how we can make better use of the limited resources and energy we have to combat the potentially devastating consequences of present and predicted climate change. So the field I work in is called ancient DNA, pretty self-explanatory, means old DNA. Ancient, not grandma, but uh, you know, really going back in time. The oldest DNA that we've been able to recover, that we're sure of the age, is about 700,000 years old. And that was from a horse bone that was preserved where we shot that first video in the Klondike near, near Dawson City. We know it was that old because it was found associated with a volcanic eruption, an ash layer uh, that was deposited when a volcano erupted that we can date to around 700,000 years old. It's also the oldest ice, the oldest permafrost that's known, which is most likely why we were able to recover DNA from that bone. The place that I work is called Beringia. Beringia spans about from uh, uh, Alaska, this part of and the western northwestern part of Canada, across this Bering Sea and into I don't know if you follow American politics at all, but remember from four years ago, this was widely reported as the part of the world that Sarah Palin can see from her backyard. <laughs> Remember that? Uh, Siberia, of course, yes. So you see there's some, some white colors there in the ocean. That's just shallower bits of ocean. So during glacial intervals, when a lot of the world's water was taken up into making glaciers sitting on top of the continents, the sea level was a lot lower, and those white areas were exposed. They were actually land. And this land bridge here that formed the entirety of Beringia was really important. It was a conduit for exchange of plants and animals between Asia and North America, things like horses and camels moved from North America into Asia. Things like bison and people moved from Asia into North America. So today, this part of the world looks a lot like this. I'm actually in that helicopter whose shadow you can see on the ground, taking this photo below. But during the last ice age, it looked more like this, with mammoths and mastodons and woolly rhinos in the Asian part of Beringia two different species of horse in North America. There were giant camels, there were bears that stood 16 feet tall, and there was even a five-foot-tall beaver, which is the funniest extinct animal. So we fly out into this place in fantastic machinery like this. You'll notice that uh, some of the windows are missing from this helicopter. Uh, this is actually good because uh, it makes smoking easier when you've <laughs> taken off and are sitting on the gas tanks. Not saying that happened. Also not saying it didn't happen. We stay in accommodation like this. Five stars, as you see. Probably excellent ratings on TripAdvisor. I took this by uh, standing back from my tent and slightly unfocusing the lens so you could see the depth of mosquitoes that uh, you have to deal with when you're up there. And we search for bones wherever the permafrost is melting. This is back in Canada near Dawson City. Um, you can see that they're washing down this permafrost with that water hose, and there are folks from my group kind of wandering around, looking aimlessly at the wall that, where they're not washing down, picking up the bones that wash out in, in time. And tens of thousands of bones actually come out of this permafrost while they're doing this. We also look for bones along meandering rivers where the spring snowmelt race the rivers rise and they cut around bends and pull bones off the, the permafrost and deposit them around the next corner. 
And in a day out, uh, kind of collecting bones like this, we can collect anywhere from five to 20 or th even 30 bags like this of bones. These are mostly bison bones. I have a geologist friend who calls bison the cockroaches of the Pleistocene. They really are incredibly abundant in North America and nearly went extinct at the same time as mammoths and everything else went extinct in North America. We also find mammoths and caribou and horses, and if we're lucky, carnivores, populations of carnivores were smaller than those of herbivores, so their bones are more rare, but we find gray wolves and, and cave lions and these giant hypercarnivorous bears. And from each of these bones, we'll cut out a tiny little piece. That's just a standard Dremel tool with a cutting disc. Take a tiny little piece back and take it back to the lab and extract DNA. And using statistical approaches, uh, we can correlate the amount of genetic diversity that we see in a population at any one point in time with how big that population is. So lots of diversity means big populations, not much diversity means small populations, and we can also see things like local populations going extinct and then being replaced by individuals moving in from a different place. Lots of information in DNA that we can't see just by looking at the fossils themselves. And over the last couple of decades, we've learned a lot about how these populations responded to these past periods of climate change. We've seen bison, horses, and mammoths peak in population size and then begin to decline. Something like, in, in North America, something like 35 to 40,000 years ago. And this is interesting and important because the two main hypotheses about what caused the megafaunal mass extinctions within the last 10,000 years are that they really didn't like the last ice age, but the peak of the last ice age was 20,000 years ago, or that people killed them. And there is no evidence of large numbers of humans in North America until around 14,000 years ago. So that these populations began to decline some 35 or 40,000 years ago kind of lets us off the hook on at least the initial stages of this mass extinction event. Not quite willing to let us off the hook for finally going, driving them to extinction, but we can talk about that later. We've watched populations of carnivores like brown bears grow and shrink and move across space really rapidly in response to changes in the numbers of herbivores that they're using as prey. And we're starting to get a better idea of why some species like reindeer, caribou, same thing, are alive today. They don't like to live where humans do, which is a pretty good trick. And things like cave lions are extinct. And whenever we finish some of these analyses and we write up our papers and we get them published, they often go in pretty nice, high-profile journals, and people like to hear about it. Mammoths are cool, right? And we get calls from the popular press and from my mom, and everybody's really excited about what's going on, and I'm super excited to tell them about what we've learned and how we can apply this to questions that are important about the biodiversity that's disappearing today. But they only ever ask me one question. <laughs> And to be honest, it's kind of annoying. <laughs> and that's why I wrote this book. There really is no soundbite-sized answer to this question, and so here we go. So now uh, we have this field called de-extinction. De-extinction. It's a terrible word, right? And the reason that I hate this word the most is because it is impossible to conjugate without sounding like an idiot, right? H how do you say that you have brought something back to life using this word? Do you say you have uh, de-extunct? De-extincted, de-extinctify, it's terrible, right? Awful. Of course, we're all very familiar with de-extinction because we were around the last time it happened. And uh, everything went swimmingly, obviously. No problems whatsoever. Of course, the premise behind Jurassic Park was that DNA was extracted from mosquitoes that happened to be preserved in amber. And the scientists were able to take that DNA and piece it together, fill in the missing pieces with frog DNA, which I still don't understand, given that even at that time we knew that birds and reptiles were more closely related to dinosaurs than frogs. But eh, it's a license to, to do what you want, I guess. It's the movies. Turns out that DNA is not well preserved, well, preserved at all, in amber. In fact, uh, uh, about 10 years ago, there was a team of scientists that tried to see whether or not they could recover DNA, not only from amber, but from a much younger precursor to amber, copal. Uh, they took pieces of copal that were only from the 1950s and 1960s, from the collection at the Natural History Museum here in London, and also pieces of amber, and they selected pieces that had insects in it and pieces that didn't have insects in it. And then they extracted DNA and tried to amplify insect DNA, thinking if there is stuff preserved in there, if there is DNA in there, it's going to be insect DNA. 
And they did manage to get insect DNA out of these pieces of amber. Unfortunately, there was no correlation between getting insect DNA out of amber and copal and actually having insects in that amber or copal, which is just one of the problems that we've come to deal with in ancient DNA, that DNA is everywhere, and DNA from insects in particular is very prevalent. Turns out, amber is formed in a very hot place, and hot is bad for DNA survival. It's also very porous, and microbes, bacteria, can get into that amber, and these living organisms just catabolize, chop up, eat that DNA, destroying it very quickly. So there is no DNA in amber. Of course, there are dinosaur bones. So why not just collect dinosaur bones, take a piece out of them with a Dremel tool, like we do with mammoth bones, grind it up and extract DNA? Well, dinosaur bones are rocks, and rocks don't have DNA, right? So we can't clone dinosaurs. <laughs> of course, we do have tons of incredibly well-preserved mammoth bones that we've been picking up across the Arctic. And we know that there are mammoth mummies that are incredibly well-preserved, that contain in intact organs and what looks like muscle structure and skin and bones. These things are incredibly beautiful and really well-preserved. And that's why we are going to use mammoths as the kind of source of how we walk through how we might bring something back to life. So not how to clone a dinosaur, but how should we clone a mammoth? And in the next 30 minutes or so, I will walk you through the process of bringing a mammoth and potentially some other species back to life. There are three plants, three different plants that I'm going to tell you about, and they kind of increase in order from really, really wonderful to quite spectacularly wonderful. So bear with me as we go through these. First, let's clone a mammoth. This is what the book is called. This is what people generally think about. Cloning is actually a very specific, a specific scientific technique that's actually known in science words as somatic cell nuclear transfer. So we have two types of cells in the body, germ cells, those are sperm and eggs, and somatic cells, which are everything else. Normally, sperm and an egg would come together, fertilize, form a zygote. A zygote has a special type of cells, stem cells, that are able to become every type of cell in the body. Somatic cells are already very specialized. They have a specific set of instructions to be a type of cell, a hair cell, a cheek cell, a muscle cell, a mammary cell, a heart cell. But they can't become any other type of cell. They're fixed in becoming the type of cell that they are instructed to be. So the trick to somatic cell nuclear transfer is to take one of these specialized cells and convince it that it's the same type of cell that you would find in a zygote, in a developing embryo, that it has the capacity to revert to this primordial form and become every type of cell in an entire organism. So as Emily brought up, the most famous example of somatic cell nuclear transfer is the cloning of Dolly the sheep, which took place in the mid-1990s, the Roslin Institute in Scotland. So when Dolly was cloned, they took some somatic cells, mammary tissue cells, from a particular white U, this guy up here in the corner, and they put them in a dish in the lab and starved them of nutrients, stressing them out. At the same time, they took egg cells, unfertilized egg cells, from a different breed of sheep, so that they looked different from each other, and they removed the nuclear material, suck out the genetic material from this unfertilized egg, so that it was an empty egg with no DNA in it. And they stick these two close together and zap them with a bit of electricity, causes the membrane in that cell to break open, and the genetic material from that somatic cell to dump into the inside of the egg. And you zap it again, and the proteins in that egg cell can magically cause that somatic cell to forget all of the instructions necessary to be a mammary cell and revert to that early type of cell that is then able to become every type of cell in an entire sheep. You then develop it for a little bit, take the developing embryo, implant it into a surrogate host. In this case, was yet another breed of you, so you can see all the differences between the individuals there. And the, the, the sheep that was eventually born, Dolly, was a genetic clone of the somatic cell, the mammary cell donor, and not of the egg cell donor or of the surrogate host. So how would this work with a mammoth? <laughs> 
We go out into the field, we find an incredibly well-preserved mammoth, we take a cell and we stress it out in the lab, starve it of nutrients so that it's kind of confused and doesn't know what it's doing. We stick it inside an egg cell, probably an elephant egg cell, that zaps it and causes it to revert to that early cell. We stick it in an elephant, it grows up into a baby mammoth, and then we release it into the wild. So we do find an incredible diversity of remarkably well-preserved remains in the Arctic. Uh, this horse jaw that's up there is probably somewhere around 50 to 100,000 years old, and yet it looks like it could be a couple years old found outside. We do find incredibly well-preserved mammoths, and a few years ago, there was this expedition up to the New Siberian Islands that found a mammoth, you may have heard it in the news, that was supposedly associated with this thick, red, viscous substance that they thought might be blood. It turns out that it probably wasn't blood, but it was nonetheless remarkably well-preserved. And yet none of these remains, and none of the remains that will ever be found from a mammoth, contain a living cell. When an organism dies, the DNA and the cells that contain that DNA begin to decay almost immediately, first by enzymes that are in the body itself, and then by things like oxygen and water, freeze-thaw, UV radiation from the sun hitting those bones. When we walk outside, UV hits our DNA and causes mutations, but we have proofreading mechanisms that can go and make, fix that mutation so that we don't get cancer every time we walk outside. Once an organism is dead, those proofreading processes can't work anymore because they require energy. Of course, when an organism is dead, there's no more energy. The soil itself is full of microorganisms that infiltrate the bone and the tissue and start breaking down that DNA. Mummies, it turns out, tend to be even more poorly preserved than bones that are completely defleshed and buried and quickly frozen. One hypothesis to explain this is that the gut contents, which of course contain tons of bacteria, burst, and those bacteria go throughout that mummified body, breaking down the DNA. So we will never find in any mammoth anywhere that's found, no matter how well-preserved it appears when we first look at it, a living cell. And where there is no living cell, we will not be able to clone a mammoth. Thank you for coming. <laughs> Just kidding. I already told you there were three, right? Okay, so... Now, Emily pointed out, or, or noted early on, that a few weeks ago, this international team of scientists, led by the group from Stockholm, sequenced and assembled the complete genome sequence of actually two different mammoths. There was one from Wrangell Island that was around 3,500 years old, and another from Siberia that was around 4,000 years old. So with these two complete genome sequences, and there are actually a couple more complete genome sequences of mammoths that have been sequenced and published now, we now have this blueprint, this very long list of A A's, C's, G's, and T's, the letters that make up your DNA, that contain the genes that make the proteins that make mammoths look and act like mammoths. So, surely we could just go into the lab and then artificially synthesize these long strands of A, C's, G's, and T's, stick these into chromosomes, which of course is how it's assembled in the cells, and then get those chromosomes into the cell, and then we could do that thing where we put the cell and, the, and it does the, when you come around, then the, yeah. Well, to explain why plan B is potentially not what's going to work, let's begin by focusing on what we mean by complete in a complete <laughs> genome. So as of today, there are no vertebrate species for whom a genome has been completely sequenced and assembled. And that includes us, even though there are very many human genome sequences out there. The problem is that there are parts of the genome that are very hard to sequence through. Now, admittedly, we do have most of the human genome that we think is important, most of the parts that have the genes that make the proteins. But there are parts of every one of our chromosomes that are made up of these tightly condensed repeat regions, sometimes near the center of the chromosomes, other times near the end, also scattered throughout the chromosomes, that there is no existing sequencing technology that we can get through. We don't know how important these regions are. We think they don't contain genes, but they do have some role to play. And we don't know how long they are, and we can't sequence through them. So we can't actually start from one end of a chromosome and go into a lab and just build that chromosome using A's, C's, G's, and T's. We don't know how to do that. <laughs> 
The situation is even worse for something that is extinct, and there are two main reasons for that. The first is that the sequences that we recover from a mammoth bone or a mammoth bum- mummy are very short, and they contain all sorts of chemical damages that make them hard to read. This is because of the, the stuff that I was talking about just a minute ago, where the UV light is hitting them, and freeze-thaw is breaking things down, and, and bacteria are chewing the sequences up. So if you imagine that a modern DNA sequence is like a very long, lovely party streamer that you can sequence millions and millions of bases at a time, The stuff we get out of mammoths is more like confetti. But not confetti like this. In fact, I couldn't find a picture of confetti from the day after the parade that had been brushed into the gutter with the other trash that had been left behind. And it had rained. And there were elephants in the parade. And a flock of passenger pigeons flying. Anyway, it's really terrible. It's really disgusting. The second reason is that when you extract DNA from a piece of mammoth bone or a piece of tissue, you don't just get mammoth DNA. So if I were to take a piece of my own hair or a swab from the inside of my cheek and extract DNA and then sequence everything that's in that extract, a process called shotgun sequencing, we just want to know everything that's in there, the result would look something like this, where most of what I recovered was my DNA. That's because I'm I'm alive, I'm not particularly damaged or contaminated, as far as I know, right? About 10 years ago, I was involved with the first project to do this type of sequencing, shotgun sequencing, on a mammoth. We took a, a mammoth bone from Siberia that was around 25 or 30,000 years old, and we extracted DNA and then sequenced everything that was there. And then you take each of those little tiny broken fragments and you figure out what each one is by comparing it to this enormous database of everything that's ever been sequenced. Right? And there is some elephant genome that's available, so presumably the bits that are mammoth are going to look like they're closely related to an elephant. And what we get is this. We're about half half of the data that we recovered actually matched the elephant, and so therefore was likely to be mammoth. The rest of it was other stuff, mostly soil bacteria. You see that big chunk of blue that's unidentified? That's probably also soil bacteria. There's a huge diversity of microbes that live in the soil that we haven't sequenced yet, so they're not on that public database. So, of course, it would just come back as who knows what it is, and, but it's not mammoth, right? So about half. And, uh, We were pretty depressed about this, right? If every time we do this sequencing, we have to throw away half of the data we generate because it's not actually what we're looking for, then it's going to be way too expensive and time-consuming to ever sequence a complete-ish mammoth genome. It turns out this was an incredibly well-preserved specimen. And in the last 10 years, we've seen that most of the remains that we work with, and things are a little bit better in the permafrost than they are if you're looking at cave specimens or more recent specimens, Most of the time, we see something between about 5% and 20% of what we get is actually what we want, and the rest of it we throw away. Uh, A few years ago, the team from Leipzig, from the Max Planck Institute in Leipzig, sequenced and assembled the first Neanderthal genome, and they used a couple of different bones in this approach. For each of those bones, less than 1% of the DNA that they recovered was Neanderthal. They had to throw away more than 99% of the data that they were generating. So instead of looking for just the confetti that we're finding in the gutter after the parade, we're actually looking for just the purple pieces of the confetti, which is really hard to do. And this is a major problem. Of course, we do live in an era where there are a lot of genomes that have been sequenced and assembled, and this is how we make sense of the stuff that we can get out of these bones. So if we are trying to sequence and assemble the mammoth genome, we have the elephant genome as a scaffold, a kind of map that we can line up on our computers and then take each of those little pieces and see where it fits in across that elephant genome. And if we're interested in in sequencing the Neanderthal genome, we have a lot of human genomes that we can line up those pieces and see where they fit. This is great, but it's also kind of a problem in that if you imagine that there's some big evolutionary difference between a mammoth and an Asian elephant, say a mammoth had some big duplication event and there's a whole bunch of DNA that mammoths have, but elephants don't, we wouldn't have that in our scaffold, in our map. And because there's so much stuff that we don't know what it is, we would probably just throw all that stuff out, thinking that it was just another batch of soil microbial DNA. And if we're really interested in knowing what the most important difference is, distinguishing Asian elephants and mammoths are, then one might think that those parts are actually kind of important. But we won't see them. <laughs>
Another problem is that even if we could generate this long sequence, it's not the same thing as having a living cell, which, remember, is what we need if we're going to then go ahead and clone this thing. So we are getting better at stringing together long sequences of ACs, Gs, and Ts, but we can't go that long before the technology we have starts making mistakes. We don't know how then to take these long sequences and wrap them up in such a way that sticks them into chromosomes and allows them to turn genes on and off. And even if we could do that, we can't actually insert chromosomes into cells. So if plan B is the way that we're thinking we're going to go, we're pretty much stopped at step one. Kid gets a lot of play in my talks. He's a very sad kid. <laughs> of course, there is another way. And plan C, this is the plan that is most likely to be the one that uh, one might use to bring an extinct species back to life. And so this is where I'll be spending the rest of the time trying to, trying to spread it out. Before, we, uh, to, to, before I get into the details of this, I think what's most critical to understand about mammoths and Asian elephants is that they shared a common ancestor relatively recently in evolutionary time, about six million years ago or so. And as such, they share about 99% of their genomes. They're 99% identical. So when we have an Asian elephant, we already have a 99% mammoth, right? So all we have to do if we're going to engineer a mammoth or take that Asian elephant and slowly change it so that it's more and more mammoth-like is to identify that last 1% and swap that out. And that's what this is, kind of in a very over, overly simplified way of thinking about it. It's kind of like a cut-and-paste job, where you line up your DNA sequences, you find where mammoths and elephants are different, you cut out the elephant version and paste the mammoth version in its place. So we now have several different Asian elephant genome sequences, and we have several different mammoth genome sequences, and we can start to compile a long list of places where Asian elephants look like one thing and mammoths look like something else, and we think that these are potentially important differences between them, and these are the places that we're going to cut and paste. So imagine that we had a machine that we could program to go to a very specific place in the elephant genome. We could send this machine into an elephant cell in a dish in a lab, and it would find exactly the same place every time, because you've given it very precise instructions about where to go. And you could give that machine a little package to take with it. In this case, the package would be a small, artificially synthesized strand of mammoth DNA. And this machine, you could inject into the cell with this little package. It would find exactly the place in the genome that you wanted to change. It would grab a hold and chop it out, chop out that elephant version of the gene so that the mammoth version could be stuck in there in its place. Well, we have that machine. And it's not something that is artificial, something that we've made up. It's a naturally occurring protein enzyme complex. It's found in bacteria and archaea and is used by them to fight invading pathogens, to, to stop themselves from getting killed by disease. It's called CRISPR, CRISPR-Cas9. You've probably heard about it in the news recently because it's incredibly powerful and super scary, but we're not going to go there just now, right? This CRISPR-Cas9 system is our little machine. And here we have this red strand, that's the elephant DNA, and the blue strand is the way that we tell this machine exactly where to go in the genome to find that precise bit of elephant DNA that we want to change. And we send the CRISPR-Cas9 system into a cell along with this synthesized piece of elephant DNA. It finds the place in the genome it wants to go, and it cuts the DNA strand. It cuts both strands of that double-sided DNA. Now, cells don't like it when the DNA is broken. It's not good for cells. It makes them die. And so evolution has created a couple different mechanisms to fix these types of breaks. So the next step in this process is to harness the cell's own repair mechanisms to make, to close that gap. And in closing that gap, to actually stick in that synthesized piece of mammoth DNA. So you end up with an elephant that is a little bit mammoth-like. Just a little bit. So what, what would we want to change? We can use this technology. It does exist. So what, what should we target? Well, there is starting to be a long list of genes that are potentially different and important between Asian elephants and mammoths. The first of these genes to be identified was identified about five years ago by Kevin Campbell's lab in Manitoba. I went backward. Uh, sorry. Sorry. 
And they found that uh, the hemoglobin, which is a protein in red blood cells, which are responsible for carrying oxygen around the body, they found that um, the woolly mammoth version of part of this hemoglobin complex was different from the elephant version, the Asian elephant version, by only three changes. These three lines that you see on the tree here leading to woolly mammoth. And they made both of these molecules in addition to the lab and wanted to know why. So what, what are the consequences of having these three differences? And they measured how well these red blood cells carried oxygen around the body at different types of uh, pHs and different temperatures. And they found that these three changes, just these three changes, were sufficient to let that woolly mammoth version of the red blood cell carry oxygen at much higher efficiency when it was cold. So this is very clearly an adaptation that evolved along the lineage to woolly mammoths as they moved out of their tropical habitats, the common ancestor moved out of the tropical habitat into somewhere cold. So what else? So from these data that we have, these long lists, there are, well, there's one team of researchers based at Harvard, the Wyss Institute there, and led by George Church, who's the guy over here on this side, that have been compiling a list of these genes and designing these CRISPR-Cas arrays to actually swap out mammoth genes into, swap mammoth genes into Asian elephant cells growing in a dish in a lab. And they have so far attempted to make CRISPR-Cas molecules to change 14 genes, 14 different genes, and they have succeeded at changing 14 genes, all of them. Every single one of these has worked so far. So they now have, in a dish, in their lab, a cell that is a very small amount mammoth. Of course, that's very different from having an actual living, breathing mammoth, but it does tell us that at least this first part of Plan C is something that is potentially doable. We do have mammoth genome sequences. We do have this genome editing technology in the CRISPR-Cas9 system, and what that gives us is a cell, a living cell, an elephant cell, with a little bit of mammoth DNA injected into it that we could then clone using somatic cell nuclear transfer. And then the next step, of course, would be to put it into a surrogate host, have it grow up and move out somewhere and be happy, right? I like to call this second part of the extinction phase two. Phase two has not received as much attention by the popular media or as phase one has. You kind of hear in the news about this genome sequencing and about these people who've swapped out these genes, and the conclusion is that tomorrow we're going to have mammoths. Tomorrow, mammoths will be wandering through the countryside, and isn't it going to be wonderful? Well, that's not true. Mm, because we can't do this, right? We can't do that part. It turns out that there are technical hurdles in the way here, that uh, there are intricacies of the elephant reproductive system, which means we can't clone elephants. One important component is that elephants have a hymen that grows back between each pregnancy. You can imagine that a baby developing an embryonic elephant is actually quite a heavy thing, right? And this hymen has a hole in it that's small enough for a sperm to pass through, but certainly not something that a developing elephant embryo could pass through. So until we can solve that particular technical hurdle. Cloning is just not something we can do with elephants. Not to mention problems with growing up something that's a different species inside a surrogate host or finding a place for it to go. So, stepping back a bit from talking about elephants now, to think a little bit about the feasibility of phase two of de-extinction. Of course, mammoths are, are not the only species that is, are being discussed as a potential candidate for de-extinction. There are lots of different species. I'm kind of convinced that people only talk about mammoths most frequently because it's, it's getting to be common knowledge that we can't clone dinosaurs and mammoths are the next best thing. But uh, there are other species that have been suggested, so... So the first step in phase two would be to find a surrogate host. So with some species, it should be relatively straightforward to find a surrogate host, species that have very close living relatives, for example, like the Bucardo, this ibex that went extinct, that used to live in the Pyrenees, that mountain goat that went extinct in the early 2000s. There are other subspecies of mountain goat that would make reasonable surrogate hosts for a developing uh, um, Bucardo. But the more evolutionary distance there is between the thing that is extinct and the thing that you're trying to use as a surrogate host, the harder it might be for that surrogate host to actually bring that developing embryo to term. In some cases, there may even be physical constraints associated with uh, 
carrying a different species inside your body. Probably not true with mammoths and elephants. I was really excited to write this part of the book where I was going to talk about how horrible it would be for an Asian elephant to carry a mammoth. So I wrote an email to Adrian Lister, who's at the Natural History Museum here, who's uh, probably the world's mammoth expert. And I said, oh, tell me, tell me how big mammoths were. And he was like, oh, they're about the same size as Asian elephants. I was like, damn. <laughs> Scratch that part of the book. But in fact, there are some species that are candidates for de-extinction where there would be physical constraints. My favorite example is uh, Stellar's sea cow. That's this guy here at the bottom, yeah? And that's a scale right there, scale. So these, Stellar's sea cow, they went extinct a couple hundred years ago. They lived off the coast of California, across the Aleutians and into the Commander Islands. Um, apparently, one of these could feed a crew of 30 to 50 men for many weeks, which is probably why we killed them all. So the, most, the, the closest living relative of stellar sea cow are dugongs and manatees. And if the same size ratio applies to newborn dugongs and manatees and adult female dugongs and manatees as uh, applied to stellar sea cows, then a newborn stellar sea cow would be decidedly larger than its mom. <laughs> Probably not going to work. It's also true that we and every other organism are much more than the sequence of our genomes. In fact, we are a combination, a product of the sequence of our genomes and the environment in which we live. Um, anyone who knows identical twins that are elderly knows that by the time these individuals are, are even, you know, 50, 60, 70 years old, not that 50 is elderly, sorry, my mom would kill me if I said that, right? <laughs> I call myself elderly before I belong here. Um, anyway, by the time these individuals are, are in their 70s and 80s, these individuals are, sometimes you can't even tell they, they're related to each other. They look different, physically look different. Their genomes are identical, right? The differences in their appearance are due to the different experiences that they have during their lives. Their different stresses, their different diets, the different things they were exposed to, and that exposure starts prenatally. So we're already talking about a species, if we return to elephants and mammoths, that are 99% identical at the genetic level. If we swap out a few genes and we have this developing embryo growing inside the body of an elephant, that developing embryo will be exposed to elephant hormones and an elephant diet and elephant stresses. It will be born to an elephant. And elephants, when they're born, they will eat the poo of their moms to establish the community of bacteria that they require to break down their food. We're beginning to know, we always hear every week, you have, hear stories in the news about how important the microbes that live in our guts are to making us look and act the way we do. This individual will have an elephant's gut microbe. It will be raised in a community of elephants and consume an elephant diet or whatever it is that elephants are fed in captive breeding environments. And speaking of captive breeding environments, there are, of course, ethical considerations. And this is the point at which mammoth de-extinction, to me, becomes something that we should not do. We know very well that elephants don't fare well in captivity. Elephants often fail to reproduce in captivity. If they do, they sometimes injure or even kill their young. Until we've learned how to meet the physical and psychological needs of, of elephants in captivity, we shouldn't be keeping them in captivity at all, much less using them in these kind of crazy, harebrained scenarios where we might be bringing something extinct back to life. Of course, every different species that we consider for de-extinction will have different technical and ethical considerations along with it, and there may be species where the ethical considerations are not as dire or important as it is with mammoths. And finally, it would be remiss of me not to acknowledge and point out that the environment in which these species lived has changed considerably since they went extinct. And environments and ecosystems are, of course, not static. It's not as if uh, an ecosystem, an individual goes extinct and a gaping hole remains in an ecosystem that you could just slot this individual back into. It will change, it will adapt, new species will come in. This picture here, is this is the uh, lake? This is the Great Lakes in the eastern coast of North America, taken from night. This is the native range of the passenger pigeon. 
which is one of the species that has been considered for de-extinction. Passenger pigeons went extinct about 100 years ago. When Europeans first arrived in North America, they noted that these birds flocked in the billions. In fact, the first official census of passenger pigeons by a European who arrived and saw them flying in Newfoundland was that there were an infinite number of them. <laughs> Where would we put an infinite number of passenger pigeons in this ecosystem? Where would we put them where people wouldn't just decide that they wanted to make them re-extinct, right? <laughs> so de-extinction, can we do it? Not yet. But the technology does continue to advance, and all sorts of technologies are evolving. There may even be some day where we could bring a mammoth back to life without evolving, involving elephants at all. So I have to say that we can't yet put this qualifier on it, because I do believe that at some point we will be able to bring extinct species back to life. But I think a bigger and possibly more important question is whether we should. And as someone who has written a book about this, clearly I have an official and very, very sincere and absolute position on this. And I do. I don't know. <laughs> I think it really depends on which species that we're thinking about bringing back, and our motivations for doing so. So there are several different de-extinction processes, that de extinction projects that get a lot of press. Uh, there's the heath hen project, this is the prairie chicken that used to live on Martha's Vineyard, the passenger pigeon here, these are projects by Revive and Restore out of San Francisco. Uh, the gastric brooding frog, which swallowed its tadpoles and barfed them up as fully formed frogs. I would like to see that thing back, just because that's pretty <laughs> freaking cool. <laughs> Thylacine, the bully mammoth, here's the auroch, there's a backbreeding project in the Netherlands to resurrect the thing that was ancestral to all of our living domestic cows. This is the Bucardo from the Pyrenees, picture of one of the last individuals that was alive, and this is, of course, the stellar sea cow. And in each of these cases, we hear a lot of news about progress that's being made, but there actually isn't that much progress being made because these teams are really focused on just trying to understand the technology as best they can on the budgets that they have, which is zero, right? <laughs> All of this work is being done in the back corner of somebody's lab, you know, just waiting for some technical breakthrough from a different field to allow them to move forward. But these people aren't just doing this haphazardly. I mean, I, all of these groups, when we have these discussions and meetings, are very deeply concerned with trying to, as we see whether it's technically feasible, really decide why. Why do we want to bring these things back to life? And just to illustrate the thought process that goes to this, I'd like to step back to talking about the mammoth. And ignoring that it's technically not possible to bring a mammoth back to life, and ethically a terrible idea to bring a, a mammoth back to life and something that we shouldn't do, what are the reasons that we might want to consider doing this, should the technology advance to the point where we can? And I can think of two reasons, two reasons that we might want to have mammoths. The first is ecological. There's a place in northeastern Siberia, uh, up here near Chersky, uh, that Russian scientist Sergei Zimov, who's the, the head of the Northeast Science Station, the Russian Academy of Science, has been buying up land since the mid-1990s, and he calls this land Pleistocene Park. The Pleistocene was the time period when we had these big beasts before the Holocene, which is the interval we're in today. Obviously, he's thinking about the movie, right? But Pleistocene Park. And he's preparing his Pleistocene park for the return of the Ice Age beasts. And so far, he has bison from Canada, horses, and about five different species of deer. And he's been doing some experiments with these guys, where he's allowing them to graze in some parts of the park, but not in other parts of the park, to see what the consequences of having these animals on the landscape are. And here's a picture that Sergei took uh, one early spring. And so there aren't animals on this side, the side with the house, not grazing. And you see that there's about one, one grass species there. It's not a particularly productive part of grassland, certainly not sufficiently productive to sustain a large population of grazing herbivores. On the other side of the fence, he does have herbivores. And you can't see it very well, but there are green patches here, and those green patches are pretty diverse. There are a lot of different species of grass and tiny shrub that have come up, started to, started to grow in these areas where he has these grazing herbivores. Importantly, this is really early spring, so nothing has had time to regenerate 
great just yet. So all of that green stuff that's there is actually still there, despite having grazing herbivores, and lots of them on this land throughout the very harsh, cold months of a Siberian winter. Just having these animals on the landscape has been sufficient, turning the soil, recycling nutrients, moving seeds around. They have essentially created the habitat that they need to survive. And not only has Sergei seen the growth of these populations naturally in Pleistocene Park, but he's also seen things like saiga antelope that live elsewhere in Siberia, but often struggle to find enough to eat. Come and visit the park because it's just such a rich resource. He points out that the largest herbivore, the mammoth, may, like the elephant does in its environment, play a particularly important role that is still missing. And he tries to make up for it sometimes by driving around with massive like road-making machinery, but, you know. But it's clear that these herbivores have already re-established these interactions that have been missing since these animals went extinct for so long. And this, to me, is one of the most compelling reasons that we might think about bringing species back. If there are interactions that are missing, because of an extinction that could be re-established, to revitalize that habitat, not only because we want to bring something back, but to save the species that are there today. That, in my mind, is a compelling reason. The second reason is more emotional. Few of us can imagine a world without elephants. And yet, Asian elephants are endangered. And every year, there are fewer of them. And their habitat is declining as human populations grow. And we're struggling to keep uh, poachers away from them, to kill more of them. What if we could use this technology not to bring mammoths back to life, but to edit the genomes of Asian elephants in such a way that they were able to survive in colder habitats. We could expand the range of habitat that these animals could live. They could live in Europe or North America or even Pleistocene Park in Siberia. What if we could use this technology not to bring something back that's been gone for a very long time, but to save species that are alive but endangered today? And why not continue to think big about what this type of technology might do. Black-footed ferrets are a population of little grubby things, actually not grubs, they're very cute, that live across the central plains of North America. Over the last couple decades, there was a massive extermination program to try to get rid of them. And people thought that it was successful until a small population, an isolated population of surviving black-footed ferrets was discovered. Unfortunately, there were very few founders in this population, and their genomes are nearly identical. And today, there's a disease that's killing them that they do not have any immunity against. There are black-footed ferrets in museum collections that date to the last 20, 30,000 years. And there are black-footed ferrets in a really cool collection called the Frozen Zoo that's in San Diego, associated with the San Diego Zoo, where Oliver Ryder has been capturing tissue samples of things that are alive but endangered for the last couple of decades. And he has black-footed ferrets that are not from this population, from a different population with much more genetic diversity. What if we could use this technology to isolate the parts of the genome that provide immunity, diversity and immune response from these frozen and museum black-footed ferrets and insert, swap out the part of the genome in the genetically identical black-footed ferrets with this increased diversity? Could we use this technology potentially to increase the response of this population to the disease that's killing them, in fact, saving this population from extinction? De-extinction isn't possible, and it's crazy, right? And there is absolutely no way that we're ever going to recreate something that is 100% identical to a species that is long gone. But the technology behind de-extinction, I feel, has a tremendous potential to reframe our possibilities of what we can do to try to fight the sixth extinction, the extinction crisis that's going on today, to save species and habitats and ecosystems that are alive today. And that, I think, is the most important and potential use of this technology. Thank you.